Good morning. We are wrapping up a series today called The Game. Every single person is in the game. I, I was thinking back today, and uh, most of you don't know this about me, but I, I played football. I did. I uh, played City League football, played about four games, and that wound it up for me. Uh, but I'll never forget the, uh, when I, my buddies talked me into going out for football and went out, and the coach called me the night before, and he said, Tool, you're going you're gonna to start tomorrow at left tackle. And I was, oh, you know, I was in the game. I was in the game, and I, I didn't know the plays. They tried to tell me plays. I didn't know. I just, when they snapped the ball, I just started pushing people. So uh, that was my football career. But I was in the game, and that's what mattered. And you're in the game, whether you, you realize it or not, whether you're, you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, whether you're a church person or you're not a church person, doesn't matter. You're in the game. If you're living, you're breathing. If you're here today, you're in the game. And we've been talking about this game, and culture says this. Culture says to win the game, it's the one with the most toys. It's the one with the most stuff. It's the one who has accumulated the most money, those who are the most popular, those who have positions or status, and that's how, by culture standard, you win the game. But God has a different idea about the game and who wins according to it. And in fact, Jesus said it's just really, really simple. The object of the game is this, be rich toward God. To be rich toward God. And, and, and in other words, he was saying this, when the game is over, all that's going to matter is God's assessment of our lives. What God thinks about our lives. When the game is over, that's all that's going to matter, whether we lived for the temporal or we lived for the eternal. You see, because here's the thing, here's the thing, and we talked about this last week, let me get the right slide. Wise people... Wise people build their lives around what is eternal and they squeeze in what is temporal. And that's usually just the opposite of culture, isn't it? We're like, well, let's get, oh, you know, we want to get all this temporal stuff. We want to get all the stuff we can get, all this, and we're trying to get all the temporal stuff in and, and we squeeze in the eternal, but it's just the opposite. And in order to live like that, we have to be able to distinguish what is temporal from what is eternal. We talked about that the very first week. Think for a moment. What gets the majority of your time? What gets the majority of your energy? What gets the majority of your resources? What do you value the most in life? Now, before you give me the church answer and you go, Jesus, you know, that, that's the standard answer. But before you give that answer, think about it. What do you value the most? What gets the most of you and what you have? And you see, the true test, you've heard me say this many times before, the true test of that is let's look at your calendar and let's look at your bank account. Because those two things alone tell us what we value as people and where we make our biggest investments. Another way is, is what relationships do you value? And how much have you invested and poured in to those relationships? In other words, what will last and what goes back in the box. And then last week we talked about scorekeeping. Scorekeeping. We're all scorekeepers, whether you admit it or not. We all keep score some way, somehow, in some form. We tend to keep score in life. And, and the most common ways that we tend to keep score, we keep score by, number one, comparing to others. We, like, we compare to people above us. We want to get up there. We compare to people beside us. And then we compare to people below us. And we go, well, we're, you know, we're better than they are. So we compare is one way. The second way that we do this is, is through competing. We compete with one another. We try to one-up one another. I mean, you may be good, but I'm going to try to be just a little bit better than you. And the third way is climbing. And we talked about the ladder. Everybody wants to get a little bit higher up on the ladder. Go that one next rung on the ladder. And we, soon we find out that those, those rungs get further and further apart. And it gets harder and harder. And there's always going to be somebody above us on the ladder. And oftentimes, if we do reach the top of the ladder, we often find out that that ladder's leaning on the wrong building. It wasn't the one we wanted to go on. These are the way that we tend to keep score in our life. But God's system is totally different. And we talked about that last week from Philippians 2. And God says, here's the scoring system. Here's how I keep score. It's by humble service. And we talked about the entire life of Jesus 
I mean, here's Jesus. Jesus is, is in heaven. Jesus is beside God. Jesus is there at the creation. Jesus has all the power, all the authority, all the glory. I mean, he's got everything. And here is Jesus, and we look at his life, and his story is not of someone climbing up the ladder. His story is someone, the story of someone coming down the ladder. Jesus' entire life was a life of demotion. It was a life of him coming down the ladder. And one of the things we said last week, if you spend your life trying to climb up the ladder, you're often going to pass Jesus because he's coming down the ladder. And Jesus said this. Jesus said to keeping score, he said, here's how I define it. It is serving and self-giving love. Serving and self-giving love. That is the most godlike thing a human being can do on this earth is self-giving love. Self-giving love. Those who make themselves humble servants, they score big with God. Now, if you missed the first two parts of this series, you can go to the website, you can go to our Facebook page, you can watch the videos and you can catch up. But today we're going to wrap it up. And today I want to talk about something very, very important. I want to talk to you about something that wars have been fought over. It's something that has caused husbands and wives to split up. It's something that has called dissension between parents and their kids. Something that, that people have taken their own lives over. Something that people have murdered over, cheated over, lied about. It has divided countries and caused countries to topple. And it's also caused churches to split and divide. Anybody have any idea what it is? Good. So this will be new. Here it is. Money and stuff. Anybody got some stuff? Money and stuff. There's an interesting story in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus encounters a young, rich man. I mean, they just, they, they go ahead and tell you up front, this guy's loaded. I mean, he's got stuff. He's got some money. And Jesus encounters this young man. And this young man comes running to Jesus one day. And he said, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life. What do I have to do to really win? I'm winning now. I mean, I'm winning big. But what do I have to do to really win big? And Jesus says, okay, since you're into doing, he said, let me give you some stuff to do. He said, keep all the commandments. Keep all the commandments. He said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't testify falsely against your neighbor, don't cheat anyone, honor your father and your mother. And, and the guy is just sitting there and he's smiling, his chest is probably thrown out and his head up and he says, I've done all of that. He said, in fact, I've done that since I was a little kid. He said, what else do I need to do? And this is where it gets interesting. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love. He really felt love for this rich young man. And he said, there's still one thing that you haven't done. There's still one thing that you've got to do. And he said this, go sell all your possessions. Give them the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he said, then come and follow me. And this young man, the next verse tells us what he did, and he did what you would do and what I would do. He responded probably the exact way that you would respond, and the many of you responded this morning when I said we're going to talk about money and stuff. And this is their response. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And that still happens today, especially when you talk about money and stuff. Faces fall, faces get distorted, and we become defensive when we're talking about our money. But I believe this encounter with the rich young man and Jesus, this, this encounter gives us a couple of important truths about winning the game, winning at what matters most in life. And the first thing I think it teaches us is this. Everything we have. Everything. Everybody say that with me. Everything. everything. 
everything we have belongs to God. Everything. Your house, your car, your business, your job, your boat, your bike, your condo, your cabin, your gadgets, your toys, your family, your money, even your body and your health. Everything belongs to God, and it's on loan from Him. It's not permanent. You know, and, and just a little side note, that's why I, I've never understood when we mention the word tithing, I've never understood why people would get so uptight and defensive about that. Because it all belongs to him anyway. And he's just asking for a percentage of it back. He, he could rightfully say, I want everything. He could have told us what he told you. Oh, man, you just get, go sell everything and you bring the money to me and distribute it to the poor. But God said, hey, it's on loan to you. And I'm just asking for percentage back from that. And tithing is a way to remind myself that everything I have is not mine, it's God's. Every time I write a check, every time I put something in the offering plate, it's a, it's a visible reminder to me to bring me back to reality to say, hey, I own nothing. God owns it all. God has entrusted me with this. You know, it's strange how we start out with everything and accepting everything as a humble gift and grateful gift from God. I, I was thinking this week of so many so many things in our life that uh, when we got married, we, we got married and left on our honeymoon, we didn't even have a place to live. There was no place available. We didn't have a place to live. And while we were on our honeymoon, a little duplex came open, and, and some people got the duplex for us. They even moved our what little furniture we had. They moved it into it, and we came home, and we were like, oh, you know, we just like melted. It was like, oh, God, thank you. Thank you for providing us with a place to stay. I remember one of the first vacations we went on when we got married. It, you know, we had some unexpected expenses that had come up that month, and we were going with another couple, one of our best friends, and we were actually going to go on a vacation together, and it came time to go, and we didn't have the money, and we were leaving after church on a Sunday, and, and after that Sunday service, we were out in the parking lot, and we were like, what, you know, what, how are we going to tell them we're not going to go on vacation with him and all this and, and a man walks up to me and he shakes my hand and there was something in his hand and he said I hope you have a good vacation he walked off and I looked and there were four one hundred dollar bills in my hand we were just oh God thank you thank you God for what you've done I, I, so many stories I remember when I was diagnosed with colitis and three weeks with no food, three weeks with just a few sips of water and Gatorade over three weeks, lost about 28 pounds, wasn't able to eat, sick, I thought I was dying, spent a week in the hospital, they finally figured it out, got me back on track. I remember sitting down to the first solid meal that I was able to eat in over three weeks and I literally started crying. I was like, this is weird. But I was saying, thank you God for this food I'm about to eat. I remember all of these things and so many gifts that God has given us over the years. And we've like, God, thank you so much. I, I, I'm sure you've got stories you could tell as well of things that God has provided. And you were like, oh, it was only God. It had to be God. Thank you so much, God. But if we're not careful, we come to expect those things from God. We come to expect them. He owes us that. I mean, we, we've earned that. And we own that because we worked hard. We own that, and, and when we own it, we think it's for our pleasure. And that's why we get uncomfortable when people talk about money and our stuff. And that's why we respond, well, that's a personal issue. No, that's, that's between me and God. That's just a personal issue. It, it's mine. And we've lost sight of the fact that all that we have, everything we have, belongs to Him. And He's just loaned it to us. And here's the problem. We confuse stewardship with ownership. 
God begins to entrust some stuff to us, and then suddenly we think we own that stuff, and we use that stuff at our discretion. And we start playing the game like it's all ours, and the goal of the game is to get all you can get while you can get it, and we start believing the consumption assumption. The consumption assumption. We think that we assume everything that we have is to be used for us. And we live as though the one with the most toys win, and we've missed the point. We've used the majority of our time, our energy, and our resources to build our kingdom while tipping God's kingdom. Let me put it this way. I heard this illustration used one time. I thought it was very good. Suppose you have a lump sum of money, and you go to the banker, and you say, I'm going to put this money in your bank and it's going to draw interest and it's going to accumulate interest and, and at some point I'll come back because I'll need to probably use some of that money. So you put all your money into the bank. Everything you have, you put it into the bank for it to draw interest. Well, about five or six, seven years go by and you go to the bank and you say, you know, I'm going to need to withdraw some of that money for this particular project. And your banker, he starts wringing his hands and starts sweating and, and he says, uh, well, he said, um, you know, our roof was really bad and we needed to put a new roof on our house and we didn't have the extra money to do that so we took a little money out of your savings and we replaced our roof and 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 then of course the kids needed braces and we had to you know we borrowed some money from your account to do that and and my wife she's always wanted to go on that you know the Caribbean cruise deal and, and she's always wanted to go on that vacation and we didn't really have the money to do it so we took some of the money out of your account to go on vacation and sir I'm sorry but there's not really much of anything left in in your account now just pretend for just a split second pretend we're not sitting in church how would you respond I could imagine probably the same way I would we would be livid we'd be ticked off. we'd be like what possessed you to think you could take my money and spend it on your stuff? I wonder sometimes how God must look at us. And he said, I trusted you with so much. What did you do with it? You see, the rich young man, he was not a bad person. In fact, he was a very religious person. It said he ran to Jesus, he fell on his knees, and he acknowledged him as teacher or rabbi. He showed great respect for Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I've kept all the commandments. I've kept them since I was a kid, since I was a child. And he probably, just reading it between the lines, he probably was like, I've gone to church every Sunday, and I've, I've given in the offering, and, and I've volunteered to serve in the different areas of our church. I mean, this guy loved God, and he wanted to make sure he was going to get eternal life. He wanted to know what it took to really win. But when Jesus responded to him, suddenly... His pride kicked in, and his true heart was revealed. He was still thinking he was master of the board, he was master of the game, and it was all his. He was wealthy, he had done well for himself, he had lots of stuff, he had power, he had position, he had money, but he forgot one important, very important thing. It didn't belong to him. You see, it's when we lose sight of that fact that we become miserable, we become uncomfortable, we tend to walk away sad. We don't want to lose or give away our stuff. And our rationale goes something like this. We work hard for this. We deserve it. It's ours to do what we will with. And my favorite of all time is this one. Well, God wants us blessed, and He wants us happy, and, and He would want me to have this. And then we become defensive when people start talking about our money because we're so attached to it and we think it is ours. Why do we become so attached? Why do we become so defensive about money? Because we think it represents our security. And what we don't realize is that money can't 
make you free. Money can't make you secure. Money can't give you hope. Money will never be enough, and it will not last. These are things that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, give me your life. Invest in me. And you'll have real treasure. You'll have lasting, fulfilling treasure. And at the end of the game, when everything goes back in the box, you'll still be holding what matters most. So Jesus cuts straight to the core. He goes straight to the bottom line with this young man. And he said, it's not about how many commandments you keep. It's not about how good you are. It's not even about all the stuff that you actually have. He said, first, remember, everything you have is a gift from God. And then the second truth was this. Jesus was not after the man's money. He was not after his possessions. I mean, think about this for a moment. All Jesus had to do was snap a finger or say a word, and he would have everything he needed, everything he wanted. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our possession. He wasn't after this man's money or possession. He wanted his heart. He wanted his heart. The problem with material things is not found in material things. The problem is found in us. It's a, it's a heart problem. Jesus was saying, I don't want your money. I don't want your possession. That's not the issue. The issue is, do I have your heart? And here's why. Because material affluence, when we have money, when we have power, when we have position, it has the power to cause us to forget God and think that we've earned it, it's ours, we use it. You see, the things, all of these things, they weaken our God awareness and our God hunger. And they set us up and set our hearts up to worship things that have been created rather than the one who created them. The problem is these things have no ability to offer me that that I desperately want and desperately need. So the question today is who has your heart? Where is your heart? Who has your heart? What has your heart attached itself to? What has our heart, it will also have our time, our energy, our resources, our money. What has our heart will have our love, it will have our devotion, it will have our trust. You know, when I got married to my wife, in that ceremony there came a time when I said, Marie, I pledge my heart and my life, my love, to you. I pledge my heart, my life, my love to you. You are my one true love. There's no one else. You get the best of me. You get my time. You get my money. You get my energy. You get my money. You get my passion. You get my money. You get my love. You get my money. You get my trust. You get my money. I mean, I gave everything I had to her. I pledged it all to her. But how foolish of me to have said, I pledge my heart to you, but what's yours is yours and what's mine is mine. And you have your friends and I'll have my friends. And you do your thing and I'll do my thing. She had to quickly realize that I may have given her my heart. I may have, I may have uh, by law, given her my heart, but I didn't give her my love. I didn't give her myself. The rich man, he was willing to do all the right things, but he wasn't willing to do the one thing that he needed to do the most, and that was surrender his heart. And the reason Jesus wanted his heart, and the reason Jesus wants our heart is simply this, because where our treasure is, that's the, de the desire of our heart will also be. He wants our heart. And so Jesus was saying in this verse, and he was saying to the rich man, and he was saying to us today, I want to be your treasure. I want you to trust me and not trust in your treasure. You say, well, is it wrong to have wealth? Are you saying we shouldn't have wealth and we shouldn't have resources? Does God want us poor and penniless and humble all the time? No, no. But God does want us to use what He's entrusted to us 
for his purpose and to build his kingdom. You see, it doesn't matter what you have. What matters is what you do with what you have. And then the same encounter and the same principles that Jesus had with this rich young man, Paul, years later, Paul's talking to Timothy and he said, let me just... Let me just reinforce this to you. Let me just tell you, this is what it takes to win. Do you really want to win, Timothy? Here's what it takes to win. In 1 Timothy 6, he starts out with this. He said, teach those who are rich in this world. And I know some of you right now, you're going, okay, stop right there. I, I don't need to listen to any more of this because I am not rich. You're talking to somebody else, you're talking to the one across the aisle, one sitting behind me, but not to me. I am not rich. Let me just tell you this. There are over 3 billion people on the planet today that are living on $2 or less a day. If you earn about $36,000, $37,000 a year, you are in the top 4% of the wage earners in the world. You're rich. I'm rich. You're rich. So Paul says this, he said, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. He said, don't trust in your power. Don't trust in your position. Don't trust in your money to bring you contentment and satisfaction and respect and security because they overpromise and they underdeliver. But he goes on and he said, their trust should be in God who richly gives all we need for our enjoyment. He's saying, don't put your hope, don't put your heart, don't put your trust, don't put your devotion, don't put your security in your riches. I will not trust in riches, but in the God who richly provides. I will not trust in riches, but in the God who richly provides. Would you say this with me? Just together, let's say it. I will not trust in riches, but in the God who richly provides. You want to win? You want to win? Don't trust in riches. Trust in the God who richly provides. Why? Because riches are temporary. Riches are here one day, they're gone the next. They don't bring satisfaction. They'll let you down. Put your hope. God says, put your hope. Put your trust. Put it in me. I'll provide and resource you with what you need when you need it. This is not something I read in a book. This is not something that I sat down and thought, well, what could I say? You know, how can we make it? This is something that I have lived. This is something I have proven. This is something that I actively do in my life. This is why I give faithfully to God. This is why I give regularly to God. It's to prove this, that God, I am not trusting in what I have. I am not trusting in my money. I am not trusting in riches, but I am trusting in the one who will richly provide what I need. And I can stand in front of you today and say with absolute honesty and with all sincerity that God has never failed me. He has never failed to richly provide what I needed when I needed it. And then Paul goes on and he says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Realize that what you have is an entrustment from God, an investment from Him to be invested through you to touch others and to build and advance His kingdom. God wants us to realize we're not masters of the board. We're not owners, but we're stewards. And for those who accept and embrace this, he'll continue to funnel riches and blessings and resources through you 
to bless others and to build his kingdom. And if he's funneling it through you, you'll be blessed as well. And then he wraps this up and he says, by doing this, they will be storing up treasure, storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future. He said, by seeing everything as an entrustment from God, as realizing that everything you have is on loan from God, he said, in seeing that and in doing that, he said, you'll be storing up treasures. You'll be paying it forward. In other words, you'll be investing in eternity and not in the temporal. He said, so that they may experience true life. In other words, that they can win. That we win. Winning the game is not about riches and stuff in this life. In fact, Jesus said life is not measured by how much you own. What you have does not determine whether or not you win, but it's what you do with what you have that does. And at the end of the game, the end of the game, just like the night we were sitting there as a family playing Monopoly and, and I had the board. I had everything. I had the houses, the hotels, the property. I had all the cash. And just like at the end of that game when my family got up and left me sitting there at the table, I was master of the board. I was, I was king. I was top dog. I had it all. Eventually, I had to start taking all that stuff and putting it back in the box. and Put the box back on the shelf. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life. I don't want to invest my life. I don't want to come to the end of the game of my life and realize that everything that I was all about, that it'll go back in a box. And I'll be left empty-handed. Because everything, houses, cars, boats, money, investment, toys, everything, everything, Thing goes back in the box. And that just leaves you. That just leaves me. What did I do with what God entrusted to me? The thing that God desires most from all of us 